Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you for choosing to worship with us. I'm always nervous when the choir's behind me. I it just, I just can't, I don't know. Some of them, I'm just not sure what, like they're, you know, making faces at me or something while I'm preaching. Y'all, y'all let me know if they, uh, if they do that. But thank you all for being here today, for choosing, like I said, to worship with us. We appreciate that very much. There's a lot of places you could be uh, in person, or those of you who are watching online, the fact that you have chosen uh, to worship with us is special, and we do not take that for granted. Now, let me say that if you're a guest here today, maybe it's your first Sunday, maybe you've been a guest for a while, if you'd like some more information about the church, it's really easy to take that next step. Uh, In the pew in front of you, you'll see a guest card. You can fill that card out, and then as you leave today, as you got these middle doors, You'll see a basket for tithes and offerings. Just drop that in there, and we can follow up. Or you can just send me an email, just to shortcut the paperwork. Uh, send me an email to john, J-O-H-N, at mycbcc.org, J-O-H-N, at mycbcc.org, and I can answer whatever questions you might have. Now, let me make a couple of announcements before I pray for us, and then we sing. One is, uh, next Sunday night, we will not have our discipleship classes because we're having trunk or treat. Uh, trunk or treat is from five to seven uh, there on the, on, that's the south end, uh, in that parking lot. And so we've had, I don't know, 20 or so folks sign up to uh, participate in that. But let me say this, even if you're not, uh, if your car's not in it, drop by for a little while Uh, it's just two hours we're going to be standing around giving out candy and fellowshipping with people Uh, as you're out and about you know just stop by you don't have to stay the whole time but just uh, come hang out for a few minutes be a great opportunity uh, just to talk and and be with one another so that'll be next Sunday night from five to seven so we will not have our uh, regular Sunday night discipleship classes so this is week two of this week so week three will then be the that first Sunday in November so I want to make sure and we'll remind everybody as we go. So three things I want you to do for me this week. Number one, pray for somebody. Pray for someone you know who doesn't know Christ. Pray for them to come to faith in him. Number two, connect. Someone you didn't see this morning, maybe they weren't in Sunday school, maybe they're not in their usual spot for worship, send them a Facebook message, send them a text, phone call, whatever it might be, let them know that they were missed. And then number three, invite. Someone you know who is not plugged in to a Bible-believing church. Now, let me tell you who not to invite. The person not to invite is someone that right now is at church at a place that preaches the gospel and believes the word. They're where God wants them. If he wants them to move, he'll do that. He'll begin to work on them. But the people that you know that as we sit here today either are not in church at all or they're at a place that isn't faithful a place that doesn't believe the Bible, a place that doesn't preach the gospel, invite them to come and to, and to worship with you. Say, hey, I'll meet you at the door. This is where we sit in the sanctuary. Maybe a little food offer might be pretty good. You know, hey, we'll go out to eat afterwards, that kind of thing. Um, but just pray for an opportunity uh, to invite someone to come to church with you. Well, guys, I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to sing together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Sundays. We thank you that we gather on this day because Jesus rose uh, on a Sunday. Father, we would not be able to be here. We'd be wasting our time if that had not happened on Easter. So, Lord, we praise you for that, and I pray you would always keep that in the front of our hearts and minds. So, Lord, I do pray now as we sing together, as we pray together, as we respond to your word, all that takes place in this service today. Father, ultimately, what we pray and what we hope and what we will strive for through the empowering of the Holy Spirit is simply to honor you in all that we do. Lord, I pray you would empower us to do that. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, good morning. Let's uh, stand together and sing Ferris, Lord Jesus.
Good morning, church. Good morning, guests. Today I'm going to share with you out of 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. <clears throat> it says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to faith and repentance. Now what he's talking about here is the second coming of Christ, the return of Christ with the rapture and, and bringing the day of the Lord with judgment and everything and all that. And he's saying, look, be, be patient because God isn't slow to act, but he's being patient to fulfill his promise of the return. Why? To allow as much time as, as he deems worthy, as much time as he has allocated for people to respond to the gospel, for people to, to repent of their sins and place their faith in Christ. He's leaving this window open because it tells us he doesn't wish that any would perish, but that all, every person should reach repentance and faith. And so that's encouragement to us that he's leaving that window open. But it also should lead us to action. The next verse says, But the day of the Lord, when Jesus comes back, will, will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies and will be burned up and dissolved. And the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. We don't know when he's coming back. He's determined that and we don't know. And so what we should be doing is being very intentional with our time and our lives, with our conversations, with our relationships. We should absolutely be letting this motivate us to share the gospel with other people and to represent him well because the time is fleeting and we don't know when he's coming back and that door of opportunity will close for people to respond. And we know that he doesn't want people to die and be separated from him. Our next hymn reminds us that God loves us and he saves us not by anything that we have done but because of what Jesus did for us. Would you stand as we sing, please?
Well, it is only by his grace, and we praise God for giving us that grace today to gather together. I want to remind our families, we have Children's Church available. I know you hear me say that week after week, and it's only possible because of our leadership that we have. So I thank the Lord for them. I just want to remind you that it's for children up through fourth grade, and so we'll meet you at the back of the sanctuary following our prayer, okay? Well, let's pray together at this time. Father, you are holy, and Father, there is no one like you. Uh, You are God, and we are not. And it's helpful to be reminded of that as we gather together as your people. Father, I pray that you'd forgive us for where we go our own way and we sin against you. Even as your people, we can go our own way and maybe think we know what we should do and not rely upon you in prayer and in your word. So, Father, guide us in the moments ahead. We look forward to the preaching of your word. We pray that you would empower Brother John by the Holy Spirit as he preaches your word to us. Father, I pray we would respond in faith and obedience. We would be eager to hear your word, to love your word, and to live it out. As we gather today, we're reminded of our church family and some that could not be here with us today. And we want to cry out on their behalf and pray that you would strengthen them, comfort them, help them in the various trials and challenges that they face today. Uh, Lord, there are many. And there are some that we don't even, aren't even aware of today, and we pray that you'd strengthen them by your grace and bring them back with us when possible. So, Father, we look forward to the time ahead in your word. You're, you are faithful. Your word is true. And I pray that you'd move in power by your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, choir. That, uh, that's one of the songs Bill has recently added that to our congregational singing, and that's quickly become one of my favorites, and so that's a great, and it's a beautiful rendition, choir. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Uh, let me ask you all something. I know you've never done this, right? You're never guilty of what I'm about to tell you or ask you. Have y'all ever ignored something, hoping it'd just go away? <laughs> Certainly, surely, y'all don't do that, right? Maybe you've done it to a person, and they, I don't know, I'm teasing. Maybe, hopefully, you didn't do that. Um, I always love the way toddlers do this, how they respond. Because what do they do? They just cover their eyes. And they think, if, you can't, if I can't see you, you can't see me. And hopefully, you know, you won't make me behave, or whatever it is. I want to ask a question this morning, because it's, it's a legitimate one, and one that's important. What happens when we ignore God? Because, you know, it's possible to do that. Even for a believer, I want to set this out in the beginning because most of the text is going to focus on people who are not, on people who have rejected Christ. And we're going to talk about that and deal with that. But understand, some part of the application is also to those of us who have repented of our sins and placed our faith in Jesus. Because God speaks to us in his word. He tells us every day what we're supposed to do. We know his nature. We know his word. We know how we are supposed to obey. And often it's very easy to ignore that and live a life that is contrary to who he is. And there are ramifications. There are consequences for ignoring God. And so I want you to take your Bibles turn to Matthew 13 and verse 10. We're in a really a two-part sermon because if you remember last week, we looked at chapter 13, verses 1 through 9, and then verses 18 through 23, where Jesus gives the parable of the sower. In the middle of that parable, we have verses 10 through 17, where he explains to his disciples why he speaks in parables. And that's what we're going to deal with this week. So let me read it, and then I'll remind us and we can remember what we, what we saw last week. This is Matthew 13, uh, 10 down through 17. It says, And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? Jesus answered them, Well, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. For whoever has, to him more shall be given, and, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables. Because while seeing they do not see, and while hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. In their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, You will keep on hearing, but will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return. And I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, because they see, and your ears, because they hear. For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see, and did not see it. To hear what you hear, and did not hear it. What happens when we ignore God? As I said, this is in the middle of a parable. This is one of the parables that Jesus explains. The, the parable of the sower, and he's, he's just built a word picture uh, and, and, and told four different reactions. He, get, he paints a picture of a sower who goes out to, to sow his field, you know, to spread the seed. And, and he talks about that the sower spreads it and some of, it, some of the seed falls on the road and the birds come and take it away. And then he talks about how some of the seed falls on rocky places with, with there's some, some very shallow soil. And it springs up pretty quick, but then it withers away pretty quickly. He talks about how some of the seed falls among the thorns and gets choked out and nothing ever becomes of it. And then he talks about the seed that's in the good soil. And there's a harvest of 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. And the explanation that he gives in verses 18 through 23 is that the birds are Satan who comes and snatches away the word from people's hearts when they hear it. Or the rocky places are those who appear to have responded to the words and yet when persecution comes they, they give up and they flee and they walk away from the faith. The thorns are the worries of this world and of wealth and all of those things that choke out any, any sense of a need for God and then we know that actual salvation, actually responding and being saved is that picture of the good soil where there's fruit of 160 and 30 fold that those who have truly repented of their sins and placed their faith in Christ will show it through good works, through the fruit of the Spirit, through all those things that, that, that God has told us to do. That's the parable. But right in the middle of it, his disciples want to know, why are you 
Why are you doing this? Because up to this point in Matthew, we really haven't seen parables. This is new. They're a little taken back. They're like, what's, what's happening here? Because think about it. He had already preached the Sermon on the Mount. He, that's as clear as it can be. And now there's a little bit of a shift here, but he has been rejected and rejected and rejected. He begins to speak in parables. So go back to verse 10. It says, And the disciples came up and said to him, Why do you speak in parables? They were confused. They wanted to know what was happening. They had been with him for a couple of years now, and now this is something, something new, and they needed, to, you know, they needed an explanation. They just heard this, this interesting story, and there was a farmer and birds and thorns and rocky places and the harvest, and they, needed, they didn't know what was going on here. Well, Jesus is just talking to them. He's, not, he's going to give them the explanation in a minute. The crowds have gone away at this point. It's just Jesus and his disciples, and he begins to explain. It says, Jesus answered them. He says, to you it's been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it's not been granted. Forever has, to him more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. He begins to set up something interesting here. He begins to set up a contrast between two groups. Those who accept what he's been saying and doing and recognize this is the Messiah and I need to follow him. And those who have heard everything that he said and have seen everything that he's been doing and yet have denied him. See, you're either one or the other. You're either lost or you're saved. There's only two kinds of people in the world. The Bible makes this very clear. And Jesus is making that delineation here. In verse 11, he says, to you it's been granted. Well, the reason it's been granted is they've responded to what they've seen. He says, to them it hasn't been. Because they haven't responded. Remember what Jesus said earlier in Matthew. In Matthew 12, 30, he says, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. And they come to him and they say, Why are you teaching in these parables? Why is this going on? And he says, Well, here's why. They haven't been listening. They haven't been listening. That's why. But you have. And you understand. And you know what's going on. And he tells them, he gives them the theological explanation for it in verse 13. He says, therefore I speak to them in parables, because while seeing, so they see what's happening, they do not see. So they've rejected it, they don't get it. While hearing, they heard his sermons, they do not hear, nor do they understand. They don't get it. They don't know what he's doing. They don't, they don't respond to it in the right way. And here, here's what we need to understand. Jesus, his person and his purpose have been crystal clear up to this point and person after person has rejected him specifically the Jewish leaders of the day I went back and counted we're, we're in a series going through Matthew chapters 8 through 14 All right we'll eventually go through the whole gospel we're doing it seven chapters at a time we'll wrap this section up probably right before Christmas and then we'll get into something new after the first of the year but I just went back to this series beginning in chapter 8 listen to how many miracles have taken place if I counted right it was 12 since chapter 8. So I, I have to read these because I don't have them memorized. There's been lepers who are cleansed. Centurion, a centurion's paralyzed servant has been healed. Peter's mother-in-law has been healed. The seas have been calm. Demons have been cast out. A paralytic has been healed after he was lowered down in front of Jesus. A synagogue official's daughter was raised from the dead. A woman with the flow of blood with a hemorrhage was healed, and she, that was like a 14-year ordeal she had. There were blind people who were healed. More demons were cast out. A withered hand was healed, and another demon was cast out. That's about 12 miracles just all around this time. And yet... After seeing all that and seeing the miracles and seeing all those things, there are people around this who say this in Matthew 12, 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. I just read 12. And yet they've ignored it. They've rejected it. In fact, in Matthew 12, 24, it says, When the Pharisees heard this, talking about all those miracles and the casting out of demons, they said, This man cast out demons only by Beelzebul, the ruler of demons. They saw the work of God and they attributed it to Satan. They were ignoring what God was doing. And there are dire consequences for that. See, guys, ignoring God takes a willful effort to deny the plain truth in front of you. You have to choose. You have to, to just decide to be wrong. 
to ignore what God is doing. I'll give you an example. Y'all know I love science fiction. Big science fiction fan. Read all the classic guys, you know, Arthur C. Clarke and Robert Heinlein and Asimov and all those and watch the movies and that kind of thing. These are smart people, right? Let's take Arthur C. Clarke, for instance. That's the guy who worked with Stanley Kubrick. They made 2001, A Space Odyssey. That's an amazing movie. You know, the special effects are completely ahead of its time. We recently had the girls, we forced the girls, it was so funny, to watch like the first 30 minutes of that movie. I said, once we get to a certain part, you can go if you want to. Nobody stayed after that part. <laughs> but they, did, they didn't. But I wanted them to see that Dawn of Man sequence, which, you know, promotes evolution, so clearly wrong, but, but the makeup and the, all they did and the, the technology to shoot it was fascinating. But I wanted them to see the transition into outer space. You know, the, the, the monkey man takes that bone and throws it up and it twirls and then boom, suddenly it's the ship going through space. And I wanted him, because we watched so much science fiction together, I thought, I want him to see the foundation of the special effects, how, you know, Kubrick figured all that stuff out. But this is interesting. Arthur C. Clarke, who, who co-wrote that movie with him and wrote all kinds of science fiction, in the late 40s, talked about and predicted and described the geosynchronous satellite system. Before it was ever a thing, he could see it and understood it. A brilliant man, brilliant man. What was his explanation for life on Earth? Aliens. Aliens, right? I mean, there's, there's these memes out there now, this guy with the poking out hair and all that. He's like, maybe it's aliens. This is a brilliant man, and what he did, he saw mankind. He saw what people are capable of the intelligence, and all the things that, that is the image of God in people, the creativity and all that. He saw that, and his willful ignoring of the plain truth was, oh, well, it must be aliens. Now, you've got to decide to ignore something that's very clear to come to that conclusion. This is not a stupid man. This is not someone, I mean, he understood all kinds of things. These people are seeing miracle after miracle after miracle. They're hearing sermon after sermon after sermon, and they are absolutely ignoring what God is up to. I hope that doesn't describe you or me. That we see what God has said in his word, that we see what God is doing in the lives of those that we know and care about, and we see the answered prayers, and we hear the sermons, and we hear the songs, and we know that we see it, and we see it, and yet we ignore it. He keeps going as he's explaining this. He tells them where it comes from in verse 14. He says, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, you'll keep on hearing, but will not understand. You'll keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears, they scarcely hear. They have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they would, have, otherwise they would see with their eyes. You see the decision there? They have closed their eyes. Hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return, and I would heal them. He begins to quote from Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6 is one of those fascinating passages. Isaiah 6, 1, y'all know this, says, in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. And then Isaiah talks about all that he sees, the angels flying around, the seraphim, and how they touch his mouth with the coals, and all this, this great worship experience. And in Isaiah 6, 8, it says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. And we often stop right there. Because if you stop there, it makes a great missionary text. But when you read the next paragraph, what God tells Isaiah is, Okay, I'm going to send you, and it's going to be an utter failure. Nobody's going to respond. They're going to ignore you. They're not going to return. They're not going to repent. They're not going to get right. And Jesus is quoting those next verses. In verses 14 through 15, he's quoting from those verses in Isaiah where God tells Isaiah, the people are hard-hearted. They're going to ignore what I'm doing. They are not going to respond. Jesus would use this several times. And I want to give you one. This is a long passage. But in the Gospels, in John chapter 12, verses 36 through 41, God himself has just spoken from heaven. So one of those little snippets that we forget about in, in, in John's gospel, and during the Holy Week, Jesus has just come into Jerusalem. He's going he's gonna to go to the cross later in the week, and he speaks to the Father, and the, spot, the Father speaks out loud. And in the midst of that, after all that's happened, here's what Jesus says. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become sons of the light. 
These things Jesus spoke, and he went away and hid himself from them. But though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, so which he spoke. We just read it. We're going to read it again. Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason they could not believe. For Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and he hardened their hearts so that they would not see with their eyes and perceive with their heart and be converted and I heal them. These things Isaiah said because he saw his glory and he spoke of him. That hard-heartedness that the nation of Israel exhibited by continually ignoring God by continually sinning against him, and it ultimately it sent him into exile. They spent all those years in Babylonian captivity. The northern kingdom disappeared. It was gone. God just, just got rid of them. And those others had denied and denied and denied, and ultimately they were punished. But it's used all throughout the New Testament to talk about people ignoring God. One more time. The last chapter of Acts, these same verses that Jesus has just quoted come up. Paul's in jail. This is, a, this is Acts 28. It says, when they had set a day for Paul, they came to him at his lodging in large numbers. And he was explaining to them by solemnly testifying about the kingdom of God and trying to persuade them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and from the prophets from morning until evening. Some were being persuaded by the things spoken and others would not believe. And when they did not agree with one another, they began leaving after Paul had spoken one parting word. Here's what he says. The Holy Spirit right, rightly spoke through Isaiah the prophet to your father, saying, Go to this people and say, You will keep on hearing, but will not understand, and you will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull, and with their ears they scarcely hear. And they have closed their eyes, otherwise they might see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return, and I would heal them. Therefore let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will also listen. Hear me on this, guys. When we continually reject God in his word, we set ourselves up to continue to reject God in his word. It is a habit that gets built up. Any of y'all got calluses on your hands? I do. I've got a few. You wouldn't think I would, um, but I do. It's from, from deadlifting. I like, I like to lift weights. One of my favorite exercises is a deadlift. And, you know, deadlift is barbells loaded. It's on the ground. You, you bend down, you pick it up. And so you develop calluses right here, right there, because you're holding it with both hands. Well, Donna's been in the gym lately. She gave me permission to talk about this, by the way. Uh, I, you know, I don't ever, I always ask, by the way, ask first. Donna's been in the gym now for several months, and she's actually a fairly talented deadlifter, and she's starting to develop these same calluses. And every now and then she'll look at me and she'll go, look, look at this. She says, look at this. She goes, I have man hands. And here's what I tell her. I said, though, those are not calluses. Those are strength marks. That's what that is. Now, how does that get there? Well, it gets there because of, of a repeated thing. It's from holding that bar. It's from, from, from reps, from continuing to lift it. It, it. The skin and all that stuff, it begins to build up over time, right? Maybe you have a callus somewhere on your hand from using a tool. It builds up over time to protect you, to keep you from constantly, you know, being, having, having a blister or whatever it is. But it's a slow process. Here's what happens. When you and I ignore God, we start to build up a callus. And the first time we disobey, the first time we ignore, it might blister, and we'll probably feel it. But then after a while, the callus develops. You don't feel it anymore. I mean, I can't really, I can't feel that. I can see it, but I can't really feel it when I do that. And after a while, it just becomes real easy to disobey God and to ignore him. Ultimately, ultimately, in Isaiah's time, the nation of Israel, they were kicked out, the temple was destroyed, and they were gone for 70 years, and, and things were a mess. For the people in Jesus' day, they ignored him, and many of them died and went to hell because they ignored the plain truth in front of them of what God was doing. Fortunately, though, people do respond because he then turns to the disciples and explains where they are he says but blessed are your eyes remember he's, he's talking to talking to his disciples his followers but blessed are your eyes because they see in other words guys you haven't ignored what you've seen or your ears because they hear 
You heard the gospel, in other words. You heard the Sermon on the Mount. You heard all of that, and you responded the right way. He says, For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, and hear what you hear and did not hear it. See, the, the leaders, the nation of Israel, specifically the religious leaders, they should have seen Jesus coming a mile away. The first time they saw the miracle, the first time they heard him preach with the authority like they had never heard, they should have said, that's the guy. This is the one my mother and my father told me about. This is the one the rabbi told me about. This is the one my grandparents talked about. This is the one the Old Testament's been talking about. This is the one we've been waiting on. That's not what they did. They said, we don't want this guy. And they ignored him. In Acts chapter 10, verse 43, Peter would say, Of him all the prophets bear witness, that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. They had absolutely ignored the truth they had known for over a thousand years. But Hebrews 1, 1 through 4 says this, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets and in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels, as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. Let's go back to our question. What happens when we ignore God? What happens? Well, unless we repent of it, we will continue to ignore him. That's what happens. Unless we stop, unless we repent, unless we respond, we will continue to ignore him. So let me talk to a specific group of people. Normally at the end of a sermon, I talk to the saved people first and the lost people second. I'm going to flip that this week. I, mean, I know you're here on Sunday morning. I know you're watching on Sunday morning or maybe on YouTube later in the week. That means you're at least on the surface interested in the things of God. But maybe you're faking it. Or maybe in all of this, in the last few weeks, you began to see that you're not actually a, a Christian. The Lord's been, been drawing you. If you're not a believer, stop ignoring the plain truth of the gospel. Jesus died for you. He was buried, and he rose again on the third day. He paid the penalty for your sins. Your sins. All of the sins of the world, but you're the only one you need to worry about. He paid for your sins. And if you'll repent of your sins and place your faith in Jesus Christ, you will be saved. But hear me, if you've been ignoring him, if you're here today simply because it's Sunday, because your spouse wants you to be at church with them, or there's some sense of duty, you just think this is, this is if my parents came back from the dead and found out I wasn't going to church, they'd kill me kind of thing. You're just here, out of habit. And you never actually responded. Stop ignoring. And today, respond. Give your life to Jesus and be saved. But if you know him, if you know him, guys, it's also possible for us to ignore him, even for saved people. There's a good old-fashioned term for it. It's called backsliding. It's a good word. Let me give you a negative and a positive. The negative is this. If you continue to ignore God, while you will not lose your relationship with him if you're genuinely saved, you will forfeit your closeness with him. You will not walk closely with the Lord. Your prayer and life will be shambles. You won't understand his nature, his character, to help you and guide you in decisions. It, it, you will not have the richness of following Christ if you ignore what God is telling you in his word and in the circumstances of your life. That's the negative part. That's the negative part. But here's the positive thing. If you are saved, that means you have responded. And guess what? You can continue to respond because you've been made new. You've been empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. You were spiritually dead, and now you're spiritually alive. And you can respond to God's word. You, you, don't, you don't have to ignore him. You're, the callus is not there. The blister's not even there. If you want, don't want it to, you can simply do what God is calling you to do. Because it's the power of God in you. It's not you. It's not me. It's that new life that we have in Christ. So when we leave here today, if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that means 
Whatever the Bible says, you can live that. You're not going to live it perfectly. We're not made perfect yet. Jesus hasn't returned. But you and I can grow step by step in holiness and obedience and follow him. Let's not ignore him. Let's do what he's called us to do. So what happens when we ignore God? Well, if you ignore him too long and ignore him forever, you're going to spend eternity separated from him in hell. So today, if you've been ignoring him on that level, repent of your sins, place your faith in Jesus, and be saved. If you're a believer and you've been ignoring him, you've been disobedient, or maybe there's things you're supposed to do and you haven't done it yet, today, just walk with him. Be obedient. Do what God has called you to do. Stop ignoring him and live for him. In just a moment, we're going to have our, our time of response. Those of you who are watching, if you have any questions, anything you want to talk about, send me an email. John, J-O-H-N, at mycbcc.org. Just make sure that you are not ignoring him. Thank you all for being with us.